Good afternoon, everyone. Um, pleasure to be here. So I'll also extend my thanks for being invited to speak to you today. Um, so yes, it's an IDS double act, um, but I've also found out we've got an ex-student here as well. Um, so if I, um, you're also on the social protection course at IDS, so I'll do the presentation, you can do the answers and questions <laughs> afterwards. Um, but I manage the, as you mentioned in the introduction, I manage the Centre for Social Protection at IDS. And that's a global network. A secretariat is based at IDS. We work with a number of partners and governments across the world to try and extend and expand and scale up um, social protection. So I'll talk through some of these issues today. Um, an apology already, because the title I think is slightly wrong. Because um, I started by putting in links between social protection, food security, and nutrition, but I thought that was a bit boring. And um, you know, it's the, it's the slot before lunchtime. So I, I tried to make it a bit more um, jazzy by look, social protection um, above and beyond. But I think there's two things here. One is that I'm not going to do too much on nutrition, make my excuses as well. Um, because again, I think uh, I'm not food security and nutrition expert. You know a lot more about these issues than me. But I will touch on some of them. Um, but also, as you mentioned, it's to look at some of the policy issues and the wider debates out there. So I'm not going to look at program level in much detail. It's generally looking at some um, issues out there today and, and sort of the direction that social protection is going. So I'm going to start off by looking at the rise of, well, a bit of reflection because I think this is also a sort of a learning um, session you're in, so a little bit of reflection about where we've got so far with social protection and food security. Have a look at sort of where we're at, so the current view on the role of social protection, and I'll be doing that in terms of some of the instruments that are used to deliver it, but also the objectives behind those instruments. And then finally, around the issues of social protection and food security, I'll throw out some opportunities and challenges, particularly around issues around graduation and growth, which is a big agenda at the moment, and related to that is resilience. So I realise Abby, unfortunately wasn't here for Abby's presentation, you've had some discussion on resilience, but I'll be looking at that from the social protection um, angle. And then finally, how we get sort of social protection as a part of systems, national ownership, um, and issues relating to that. So. Just to start off saying how we've got where we're at in a number of different countries on social protection. And a lot of what we see um, in social protection, it, it's, it's risen over the last 10 years significantly. And a lot of that's down to the linkages between food security and social protection in many instances, where food security is a main driver of risk and vulnerability that has led to social protection programs being developed. And what we've also seen is a domino effect. When one country develops a social protection program, a number of the other um, uh, countries in the region will also follow. We saw that, so we've seen that in Africa, where one of the first and one of the most famous, because it's still the largest in sub-Saharan Africa, social protection program. Um, it meets about eight people, eight million people on average per year. The, the Productive Safety Net program in Africa was set up to move away from relief, to move away to, to, from relief to more predictable, adequate, and timely support to people. Um, that model has spread to other countries in the region. Kenya now has a hunger safety net program. Rwanda, their, their VUP program there is very much based on the model of Ethiopia. Tanzania with their um, programs as well are developing similar things. So it's spreading in that area as a direct response to um, hunger. Secondly, in Latin America, um, most countries in, in Latin America have social protection programs, and most of them take the form of a conditional program. So you get support on the basis of some health or education or nutrition uh, requirements. So we've seen you know, a couple of the famous ones, Bolsa Familia in Brazil, was explicitly set up to address issues of nutrition. It was politically unacceptable, and humanitarianly it was unacceptable, and there's been a huge amount of success now in that program in relation um, to nutrition. 
so we can discuss that um, a bit later as well so about the evidence. And again, a number of other countries in Latin America have adopted conditional cash transfer programs. I should have said in Africa, it's mainly unconditional. So most programs there, you're not reliant um, on actually going to, to um, meet some, some conditionalities. And then finally in Asia, where again, huge generalizations across the, the continents here, but rights is more of an issue in, um, in Asia than we see in uh, Latin America and Africa. So some of the programs there have been developed on the basis of rights, which is on the back of some of the successes in the rights to food. So India is probably the best example here, where we have the Mahatma Gandhi Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme, which basically guarantees work, guarantees paid work um, to those very poor people. And that's on the basis of rights because it's enshrined in law. The A is the act. Um, so it's an act in Parliament. If you go, if you turn up and the government can't give you work, you can then claim um, the monetary value. That's the theory. And it works in some states and not others. Um, but that's another story. Um, but you just see that it is spreading. I'm being very positive, but there's huge challenges as well. And it's not spreading. It's not scaling up in many instances. It's reliance on donor funds. There's an, 101 other issues. And again, the difficulty of coming and presenting generally about social protection, it's a piece of string. So, um, but hopefully we can pick up on some of these issues a bit later if you want. Now, instead of putting up definitions, which might really drive you down onto the ground, I thought, uh, what in, but I do need to describe what I think social protection is. Um, or we, certainly the way we follow it uh, at IDS. And what, so I'm going to go through sort of what are the main instruments that are delivered through, so how, how, how you deliver social protection, the main instruments, and what are some of the objectives we're trying to achieve through it. So I'm going to talk about um, four dimensions of social protection, and this is a framework we use, it's called three P's and a T. And what it does really is, it, it's a response, um, because social protection is a range of policy instruments that address poverty and vulnerability. <laughs> they can do it in a number of ways. <coughs> and I'm just going to put these four up, um, first of all. The first <coughs> sort of category of social protection is around social assistance. Because social protection is called many different things, and there's many different parts of it, social assistance, social welfare, it's, it's quite confusing. But the first set of interventions is what we classically call social assistance. And some examples there, the classic ones are cash transfers, but also food transfers, child grants. They're classified into what you call social assistance. And what they're trying to do there is, the objective is, it's a protection instrument. So it's trying to protect <coughs> the most vulnerable in many instances. So this is really around poverty, this first set of objectives around social protection. The second, though, is moving beyond looking at issues around poverty to some issues around vulnerability, because there are preventative instruments. You're trying to manage risk in a way that actually intervenes before a shock happens. So it's preventative, it, it's, it's, it's then limiting damaging coping strategies when a shock happens. There's also stresses as well, ongoing chronic issues which is trying to address. And the instruments we commonly use to help prevent um, these damaging coping strategies are insurance <coughs> mechanisms. So insurance schemes, health insurance, unemployment benefits, pensions, etc. The third then is um, a promotion aspect, promotive instruments. And this is coming more recent into the agenda, but the idea that it's not just um, a handout to people actually supporting their productive livelihoods. So some of the uh, examples of programs here are, you might have heard of public works programs, um, there's microcredits and microfinance. It's quite a contentious issue whether it's social protection or not, because it's not always focused on the poorest. And, and, but um, so it is commonly also called uh, social protection. And then asset transfers um, are an example of a way, uh, an instrument you would give to try and enhance livelihoods. And I'll talk about that a bit later in a minute. 
And then finally, which is the newest sort of area here, um, is around transformative instruments. And this is something we particularly work on at IES. In if quite a lot of the agenda um, focused on sort of economic pathways uh, to manage with risk and vulnerability. There is a big social aspect missing here, and that's what this transformative aspect is trying to address. How can you address the underlying constraints that put people in that position in the first place? So it's dealing with issues of marginalization and exclusion, um, it's a rights agenda, and um, there's some examples there of how you'd go about it, introducing minimum wage, maternity benefits, etc. That can address and help some of the most marginalized and excluded. So I've thrown a lot at you, but um, I'll step back and go through some of the issues here and how this agenda has changed and how it's been shaped. But overall, there's a movement here from sort of some short-term interventions to some, some longer-term underlying issues and constraints. So there's, there's the agenda working over a, a time span there. So. Uh, when I said I'm going to do some above and beyond, so I'll start with some sort of beyonds and where the agenda has moved, where I think the social protection agenda has moved from and to, to some extent. And one of the big things is it's, it's beyond to say, it's beyond cash transfers. We hear so much about social protection, how, um, how important um, cash transfers are, and they are, but they have dominated the agenda as well in some instances. So I just wanted to show you that there are a number of other um, instruments that we use in social protection to address some of the food security objectives. So here you see some of them on the, uh, the second column, the middle column, looking at a range of different instruments. And they go across a range of different objectives. So what I just said about, you know, from protection to production. So the first is around sort of productive um, instruments around input, input subsidies, livestock insurance. <coughs> then secondly you have um, a lot of work around sort of labour and how social protection can support um, giving people directly work, public works programmes, but there's also a big agenda about how it can um, gain, give people access to work. Um, there's decent work um, agenda but how it can support people in the informal economy as well. Um, trade is a big issue, and there's some, um, uh, again, uh, food subsidies, grain reserves, um, food price stabilisation, social protection can manage trade there. And then finally, the transfers on the bottom, this is more around the, the sort of coping objective of social protection. You know, it's meeting the needs of the, the very poorest, and some examples there. So just to show you, there's a range of different instruments and a number of different objectives in terms of food security. This is not my categorization. This is from a report which is fairly recent. It's from the high level um, panel of experts um, through the UNFAO, and one of their reports this year was on food security um, and nutrition and social protection, social protection for food security. So that's why I'm not going to, I don't need to go into too much detail if you want to have a look at all of this kinds of issues. It gives you a lot of more description on how good or bad some of these instruments are in relation to food security and nutrition. But, but that's a very good resource you could look at. Okay, so we've talked about some of the instruments. If we step back to those objectives I mentioned and how have things changed. One of the big things over the last 10 years, we have moved from thinking about social protection as just a, a coping mechanism and as a safety net, this is where the term safety net originates from. And, you know, it's intuitive, the idea of a safety net, catching the most poorest, the most <coughs> vulnerable. Um, and the bank, the World Bank, are very strong in you know, promoting that agenda. But they, using their <coughs> risk management framework, it developed to say also, beyond coping, there's a prevention aspect here. So if you intervene before, so this is thinking about the intervening before a shock um, happens. And this is where the insurance aspect comes in. So it's a way of, prevention is a way of insuring the uninsured. So that was an important step to move social protection in that direction. But secondly, and much more of a debate most recently, is moving 
social protection beyond being seen as a charity to seeing it as being central to um, rights and a rights-based approach. So moving from social protection as a charity, and you should be thankful for receiving what you do from the states, to it's actually your right and in, based on entitlements. And that then moves us towards social justice. And that's one of the big debates at the moment, is around providing social justice. How can social protection provide social justice? By tackling the underlying causes of vulnerability and poverty. So a lot of discussion around how you can form social contracts, and particularly around the equity agenda, so about fairness, and about social welfare, social protection as part of um, an equity agenda. But that's very, you know, as, there's not as much known on that agenda, how to do it, how to program on the basis of social justice. We know a lot about how to program for social protection in terms of poverty. We have really good evidence, good impact assessments done on it. Um, we know some about vulnerability, we know much less about this, this broader agenda. And we also know less about social protection and growth, which is the final point here, about how it promotes livelihoods. Because often it can take a long time to see these impacts, and a lot of social protection programs haven't been in place that long. But also, some of them are giving very small transfers. So to see the impacts of growth on that um, is not going to be seen. But there's ways to, to, to improve that, I'll talk about in a moment. But I wanted, therefore, to highlight the issue of graduation, because that's a big issue of discussion at the moment about how beneficiaries from social protection programs can and should graduate. So by graduation, we're not talking about exiting. It's not just getting people off programs and stopping support um, once they've come, you know, come across some form of line that we've decided is appropriate. It's actually, we're talking about sustainable graduation. So moving people up above the line or out of poverty, however you want to mention it, but them staying there, uh, and that's the critical point. So let's just reflect on graduation for a second. Um, I will explain this. Um, I, I'll, I'll try to explain this, but I'll just hit you with it for a second. And usually I come over and point, but it's going to be quite difficult to do that here with a microphone. So, um, But please stop me if it doesn't make any sense. But I want to just to, I'll start by pointing out that line, the A star. That's basically an asset threshold. So someone has calculated that that's a line above which we need to get people to graduate. And they can calculate it in many different ways, but um, I'm not... Oh! That function. Um, so that's A. Um, that just shows how much I'm shaking. <laughs> um, so that's the, asset that's the asset threshold. We need to get people above that line to help them graduate. But there's a couple of things. It's not a linear process. It used to be said that gradually you give social protection to people and gradually the livelihoods will improve, they'll move out of poverty. But this is showing a different thing. Because first of all, this here, this is the um, people who are asset poor. They've been measured as being asset poor. And this group here is very, the assets, they're very poor in terms of assets. You can measure you know, how much assets people are. We do a lot of that. And what this is saying here is that unless you can get people above this line, there's a dynamic disaccumulation going on. Basically, there's a negative thing going on that if they don't get above that line, they'll continually get forced down. And that's called a poverty trap. They basically haven't got enough to get out of that line. So, it's not good just giving people a small amount of assets and they gradually build their assets and they'll move out of this line. What this line suggests, because it's quite steep, it's very steep, is that you have to give people a load of assets, a big bunch of assets. It's about the lumpiness of assets. So maybe that's quite important. So actually this theory is saying you have to give people a big chunk. So it's no good giving people an ox without a cart, for example. But what it's saying that the, the positive side of this is saying that, but if you do get above this line, there's then a, a positive force going on, which will help you continue to accumulate assets and grow and, be, and continue to stay above this line. So that's the theory. And um, there's lots of discussion about that. 
and whether that's actually hypothetical or not. But a number of programs are based on this idea. Um, the whole productive safety net program, I'll, and I'll go through actually and show in a minute um, that a lot of programs are based on this. But what this does throw up is some opportunities and challenges, this idea of graduation and some of the issues I've raised so far. Because I talked about a rights agenda, and some people who believe in social protection and rights. And I'm here, but here we're talking about a growth agenda. And I'm saying that there is some tension between that. <coughs> because it's in some cases, in some social protection programs are designed around graduation, but some people are not able to graduate. Some people need um, social protection over their life course. So graduation <coughs> isn't always the objective. And there's what we call a positive dependency on social protection. Some people rely on social pensions, other people rely on disability grants. And they're not expected um, to graduate necessarily, although a lot of people do participate in the economy, obviously. But the second thing is you get social protection at different phases. You know, a lot of us will have social protection at different points. If you have health insurance, um, we have unemployment benefit going on. If we are out of work, you can get an employment benefit. Um, so there's a number of different ways. It's not necessarily uh, about getting us all to graduate out. But politically, the important point to make is graduation is a very um, favourable thing in terms, of, in, in terms of politics, particularly in Africa. So I'm just, that's graduation. Now, I wanted to talk about one other major thing that's sort of out in the agenda at the moment and has just exploded over the last few months is this issue of resilience, um, which Abby talked about a bit this morning. Um, but it's a, real, it, it's a real issue at the moment, and there's many challenges around this issue of resilience, and it very much lends itself to graduation, as I discussed. So I just want to point out some good and bad things about um, the issue of resilience. So in terms of resilience, you know, what's good is we're not just talking about people returning to as they were before they had the shock or the stress or whatever happened. We're actually, resilience as a term is moved forward a bit. In the disaster risk reduction um, discourse, they're talking about prevention again. And it's in the climate change community, they're talking about adaptation. This is how they're using resilience. So that's moving the debate a bit forward in terms of resilience. Um, it's quite an intuitive thing, you know, who can argue against resilience? Surely it's a good thing, isn't it? Um, but there's, there's actually, it is actually a bit more complicated when we go through. But it is being used as an integrating tool around risk management, and, and Abby may have talked about some of those issues this morning. It's bringing different <coughs> communities of practice together and disaster reduction and climate change and humanitarian is a good example of that. The final thing is a sort of positive here is to say politically it's a very acceptable term. I'm thinking in terms of my discipline of social protection now. Um, if you talk to governments and if you talk to ministers of finance, etc., and talk about um, coping and talk about supporting the poorest, this is a more palatable thing in terms of talking about resilience because the big Concern, in particularly in Africa, is around dependency and how social work, welfare, social protection can create dependency. That's another whole discussion in itself. But this is sort of looking at the opposite side and saying, no, again, it's, it's not going to create dependency because it's an investment. It'll build resilience. It can help help people graduate. Again, that's the political theory. Um, the other side of this discussion around resilience, though, is that the explosion in the use of it that we've seen is not backed up with um, a bit of more critical thinking, we think, at this stage. So we've seen you know, huge movements in um, a number of dif disciplines using it, but NGOs using it. You know, it's referred to in most NGOs' documents I read now, and CARE are doing a big piece on it, BOND are doing a lot of work on it. The donors have absolutely jumped on the back of this term. So the World Bank, their whole social protection policy is around the issue of resilience. DFID are using their humanitarian program on it, but it will extend beyond that in DFID eventually as well. The EC have just released um, uh, a, a paper on resilience uh, this week or last week as well. 
So it's a very live issue. But there's quite a few challenges about it. And it's, what we've done at IBS is sort of just took a bit of a step back to say we're, um, it's quite extraordinary that there's this, this amount of interest when there's still actually quite a lot to discuss and work out with resilience as well. So just a, a, a note of caution. And the first one is it's really not that easy to measure resilience because it's different things to different people. Is it an outcome or is it an ability? They're very different, so very hard to measure. Vulnerability is actually much easier to measure, um, and we, we are much better at doing that. The second point is an operational one. In all of the documents that we've seen, um, it still doesn't really say clearly what, what would a program look like if it's going to build resilience. What does it need to do? And there's a lot of literature out there which doesn't actually go into so that much detail on that work. And that, so that needs to be looked at. But the third thing is um, about how resilience has also been seen as a bit of an apolitical term. It's a, a socioeconomic issue, um, but actually there's winners and losers for resilience. If some are resilient, some will become resilient um, and others won't. So it's not apolitical, and that means that definitions actually need to pay attention to issues around agency, to issues around power, and, and to, to work out who are the winners and losers. Now, my colleague um, at IDS, Chris Benet, who um, uh, we, we've developed a paper on this that I was part of, but he's been leading and done most of the work. Um, he spends his weekends by looking at definitions of resilience, and he looked at 130 <coughs> definitions of resilience one weekend. I was doing something much better than that. <laughs> but what he did find out was extraordinary because not one of them, those de definitions, definitions pay attention to these issues of power and agency, which is central to whether someone can be resilient or not. Um, there are a couple of other things there also about so, um, resilience not being um, necessarily correlated to well-being because you can be more resilient, but you can have been so you can be moved away from your home to a safer place. Which, may, if we're talking about climate risk, for example, you're more resilient, but you've lost your social network. You've lost maybe your source of an income. So, well-being and <coughs> resilience are not necessarily positively related. And also resilience isn't a pro-poor concept. So you know, if you're behind a, a poverty agenda, this isn't necessarily the way to address that because you can still be resilient and poor. A lot of poor people are extremely resilient. So there's just things that need to be um, looked at a bit closer as we develop this discussion on resilience. That's the, um, the working paper that we've just released um, about two weeks ago, looking at whether resilience is a, a utopia or, or a tyranny and debating these issues in a lot more depth. Okay, so the final um, opportunities and challenge that I wanted to look at was how we can actually move beyond having individual instruments around social protection and how we can move to systems. And that's where a huge amount of discussion is around this um, at the moment. So I'm going to give you three quick examples of how we can do that. The first um, is describing a program that's happening in Bangladesh, and this is the BRAC, um, targeting the ultra poor um, program, where what they've done here is it shows that this is going back. This line is similar to that graduation line I showed you before, and that's what they're trying to achieve here. Uh, the BRAC program is focused on graduation as the main objective. But the way they go about that is they don't expect individual <coughs> instruments to do that. They don't expect the cash transfer to help people graduate out of poverty. They don't even expect an asset transfer on its own to graduate people out of poverty. What they're saying here, because there's a number of different things noted, is that you need a bunch of things to give, build people's resilience to help them graduate out of poverty. <coughs> So you start here by giving them a stipend. This is, they call it a stipend, the cash transfer in Bangladesh. Um, but this is, for the, this, is the, this is the poverty line. So we're talking way down. Extreme poverty and chronic poverty is a big issue, obviously, in Bangladesh. So you're giving people at that level um, some form of cash transfer. But there's a lot of other things to support that. So savings services to help them in saving some of it. 
Then you've got a lot of skills train, training going on. Then you give them the assets transfer. And why then is because in their experience and their research, which they've got a lot of, that's when people will make the best use of that asset transfer is when they've got all of those other interventions in place. So there's important learning there. But what you'll see is that the only people actually have totally lost where that is. Oh, is. Um, they only actually get access to credit. This is the microfinance issue. After they've got all of these and when they're actually buying the poverty line. So they're not giving credit to the very poorest again here. Um, but that's a, a really good example of how we need to think about social protection as a combination of interventions and combinations of instruments. It's the same in Ethiopia. The theory in Ethiopia is the same. So you have very food insecure households in the middle, um, but then you have a number of other different programs <coughs> in place to help get food security and to get graduation. So here's the Productive Safety Net program. Everyone hears about that, or a lot of people do, but it's actually a lot more than that to actually be, get people food secure in Ethiopia. This is particularly the Household Asset build, Building Program. There's, a, there's community investments on infrastructure, and there's the, the Government Resettlement Program. So the Productive Safety Net is donors, totally donor-funded, still a project. Um, it's not institutionalized in government, but governments are involved in it. The others are government programs. But, and some of the success varies on this. So they have the same type of graph as what I showed you in Bangladesh. I could have shown you the same graph. And it will say that people get social protection to start with, but then as they gradually improve, they move, graduate into the food security program, which gives them assets and other things. So it's combining. Um, elements as well. That's the theory. In practice, it doesn't always work. We don't see many people graduating in Ethiopia yet. That's very different to Bangladesh. Um, finally, <coughs> sorry you can't see this very clearly, but just want to show you just visually the amount of different programs going on in Brazil. Um, you may have heard about the Bolsa Familia program in Brazil, very famous social protection program, uh, large social protection program. Uh, figure's gone out of my head in the region of 10 million, or oh, that may be Mexico, but um, I'll find that out. But basically, um, we hear a lot about this, the Bolsa Familia, which is the social protection program, providing what they call them social security here. There's a whole other bunch of other programs go on, which form part of their Zero Hunger program, which has had massive success, Zero Hunger, in Brazil. But social protection is only a part of it. You've got a lot of agriculture programs, you've got a lot of other um, access to service programs going on. So to finish, to conclude, um, throwing a lot at you, um, I could have thrown a lot more, but I hope it's not too much, but I hope it's enough just to sort of reflect for now. And again, summarizing, I think what I wanted to get across was that we need to view social protection as a, as a comprehensive mix of instruments, basically. So it's not just about cash transfers, which is driven the agenda for a number of years, but there are lots of other options out there and a lot of other combinations we need to get to get wider outcomes. And also there's a number of different objectives. And people often drive you know, whatever they've got the resources for or their favorite instrument, that often drove social protection programming. You have to think about what you're trying to do in the first place, and that can be over a range of things from protection and coping to, to actually transforming people's lives and social justice. The second is about this issue about broader systems to ensure the maximum impact of social protection. Because in many cases, it's still projectized, it's still not scaled up, and it's not owned by governments. And that, that's obviously the big discourse and the big challenge. Um, there are real challenges in capacity for that and around ownership, but a lot has been done. Um, all of the work that IDS we do on social protection now, if we're ever asked to go and write a social protection policy, um, we do that all as part of capacity building and working with the government in every step of the way to do that, because <coughs> otherwise we see policies sitting on shelves, um, very good policies, but they still sit on the shelves. So there's certainly that taking on the challenge of capacity is what we need to do. And then finally, I just highlighted the sort of role of civil society in this. Um, as was mentioned in the introduction, I worked with the European Commission earlier this year as they developed their first 
policy on social protection, and it's actually the EU policy. It went to the Council and was ratified by all the EU member states. So they only do two a year, so it's a big thing that they've done social protection. But a big issue for them was about um, civil society and how we can encourage civil society as part of this ownership issue how it's about advocacy and empowerment, so mobilising support for social protection, ensuring the rights, uh, people's needs are included, um, and that governments are responsible developing this social contract. And then finally, participating in monitoring and evaluation on, in terms of accountability. But a big role for civil society to play, particularly in Africa, it's lacking, and the space for civil society around these issues in many countries is very small. The government don't look upon it favourably. But in Asia, that's, that civil society have driven what we see now with the social protection programs there that are based on rights. You know, there have been discussions going on for 20, 30 years. Without civil society, it wouldn't happen. So I thought we'd end up on that note, it's obviously, in civil society. But um, thanks very much for your time. Thank you.